All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, I cannot believe how fast November is flying by. If you've been following along and joining our events this month, we have been connecting with scientists, explorers, and conservationists all over the world who are working to protect uh, ecosystems as well as the amazing biodiversity uh, found within them. So it's been an amazing month of conservation. We still have a few more events coming up this month at exploringbytheseat.com. You can check out with your classrooms. And then we just launched our December lineup. We've got some great events uh, coming up in December. So we hope to see your classrooms joining us there. All right. Well, I'm so excited about uh, today's event. We have Dr. Olivia Nsingimana joining us. He is a Rwandan uh, veterinarian who designed and implemented a unique conservation project to save his country's endangered gray crown crane by working to abolish its illegal trade. So he began this in 2015 after winning the prestigious Rolex Awards uh, for Enterprise as a young laureate and has since established the Rwanda Wildlife Conservation Association. So this is a nonprofit dedicated to expanding research and conservation projects connected to endangered or threatened species in Rwanda. Prior to founding this organization, he worked for Gorilla Doctors as a field veterinarian, providing life-saving veterinary care to critically endangered uh, wild mountain gorillas. So I'm gonna bring Olivier in live with us now, joining us from Rwanda. Olivier, it's so great to see you today and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be here. All right. Well, it's, it seems like forever since we saw each other last, but we always love the work that you're doing and, and having an opportunity to share it. So I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. We've got classrooms joining in from across North America today, and they're really looking forward to some question and answer time. Uh, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, so does it mean that uh, I'm live my presentation? Can everyone see my presentation now? It is live. It's full screen. We're ready. All right. OK, so thank you. Um, so yeah, everyone, like I would like to really start by welcoming you to Rwanda. Um, as this presentation, the, the, the front uh, this screen shows you, uh, this is my beautiful country, Rwanda. Um, and for those who don't know, Rwanda, it's a really tiny, small country that is uh, in the East Central Africa. Um, sometimes people just find it hard to find it, but it's so beautiful and it's called like a, a, a land of thousand hills. Like it's so full of hills and the mountains and, and, and the lakes, so beautiful. So what I'm going to tell you is a story of a young boy who was born in one of these hills, like, uh, like you can see. So this is me. <laughs> um, when I was little, I'm going to tell you, probably my childhood was so different from all you can imagine. Um, we ran around, me and my friend, we ran around in the, in the wetlands, in the grassland, we jumped in the river, we really had fun. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I started watching TV when I was about like 15 or 18. I never had a TV at home. Um, but right now when I'm thinking like uh, of my childhood, I never regret of not having a TV because life was so fun that we really didn't even think about it. We would run around, enjoy, jump. And one of the best things we would see was to see wildlife. Um, I remember when I was a little boy, when I went to the marshland to collect water for my family, uh, watching uh, these beautiful birds. They are called gray crown cranes or East African cranes. They are so beautiful. And this time when I was little, I was probably nearly as tall as them. They can reach up to uh, 1.2 meters, uh, like standing. That's 120 centimeters. And when they are flying, when they have their wingspan, they can reach up to 180 centimeters. So they are giants in the sky and they are so colorful. So I really love them. I love them like especially watching them when they were dancing like it was so beautiful and and when they were flying and when they were roosting in the trees this was the spectacular really moments um you see like uh when i was a little boy we worked a lot for our parents and as i told you my country is so hilly that it would come from one hill like at the top of the hill to go get water at the bottom of the hill it was so painful to come up like with a jelly can of water on the head but it never, we never felt the pain because we, were, we would be distracted by nature. We would 
watch these birds, watch other wildlife. And, and it was so fun, like, that um, uh, these images have stayed in my head. Um, so, like, watching the great crown of queens, I, I remember that as young kids, we always wanted to fly like them. Um, we would try, like, put uh, some fake feathers on us, like some clothes, try to fly. We would fall sometime, but we didn't want to, to, to fly like them. They were kind of our superheroes. So growing up, I really wanted just, I loved animals. Um, and I trained to be a veterinarian. As Joe yeah, mentioned it, my very first job was to be a gorilla doctor. And um, this was really fun. I always told my friends, can you imagine like just getting to uh, to work with this amazing species? And, and, and I, I really enjoyed every single moment I would go to the forest to see them, to work with them. But when I was there, um, I started learning about other species and uh, like a really shocking, shockingly, like I realized the great crown crimes, my childhood heroes, they were really uh, under danger. Like um, the time I was looking for numbers, I realized that we only had about like 300, less than 500 remaining in a while. And without doing anything, they could have easily disappeared. So it really shocked me. And though I was a gorilla doctor working to save the mountain gorillas, I told myself someone has got to do something. So what was happening is cranes really rely on wetlands for, uh, for, 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 for breeding and for food. They build their nest in wetlands. They find their food in wetlands. So my country, Rwanda, because of the high human population density, um, because of uh, high human needs like food, so many wetlands, they are being transformed for agriculture to grow food, to graze livestock. So cranes, like many other species, they are losing their habitat. Uh, one other problem is um, these birds, they are seen as a symbol of wealth and longevity. So, so many people want to have them in their gardens. They want to have them in their gardens as paid. So the local communities driven by poverty and lack of awareness, they hunt, they capture the young cranes and they sell them to people who want to have them in their gardens. So when they end in captivity, uh, people don't know how to keep them very well. Sometimes people have to cut feathers to stop them from flying and they are not given the right food. You know, cranes, they eat uh, by their choice when they're in the wild. They will eat like a small insect. They will eat like a little, like amphibians or reptiles. They will eat seeds. They will eat like grass. They eat, they choose. But when they end in the captivity, people give them like chips, rice, uh, food that is oily, and they really leave the conditions that they would not like. So some of them, they really get like uh, bad conditions like uh, uh, deficiency um, or stress. So they can't even breed. They can't make nests and have chicks. So because of this, in my country, we've lost a huge number of cranes. So when I became aware of this problem, I told myself, someone has got to do something. Someone has got to help the cranes. So I decided to move, to leave my work with the gorillas and start the work to save the cranes. So when I started, we launched so many like awareness campaign. We went on TV and radios and told the people, did you know that the cranes that we love um, could disappear if we don't do anything? Did you know that our grandkids, our great grandkids might not be able to see these beautiful birds? So we told Rwandans, like, yeah, we all love them. Let's do something to protect them. So I asked people who have them, please, if you have cranes and you want to give them a second chance to go back to the world, call me. So people called me, and when they called me, we went to their house and we were registering. We made a database of all the captive cranes in the whole country. So when we went to someone's house, we would capture the cranes in the garden, put a unique number, on every single crane and ask more information about the trade. How much did you buy them? Where, who sold them to you? Where did they capture them from? So that we can understand more what has been happening. So once we know where all the cranes are, we would proceed to go back to these houses and take them. So we would bring them and put them under quarantine. So quarantine is a, like uh, maybe 
we get to chat about this one um, uh, after my presentation, but quarantine is the time that you put a, an animal or even a person uh, under observation uh, to make sure you can see if they have any disease before you, you, you take that animal uh, to reintroduce them in the others. So our target was to take them, the, all the cranes back to their natural habitat, to, to the wetlands, the national park, but we could not take them right away. We would like put them in a place um, where we would check uh, for their health and even observe, see if, if they have any disease, any problem that can be a challenge when we take them back, but also that can be a problem to other cranes. So we didn't want to, them to take a disease, a new disease to other cranes in the wild or other birds in the wild. So during the quarantine, we do health checks. We look for uh, gastrointestinal parasite like, uh, like uh, worms. We look for viruses, we look for bacteria, we look for different disease or even like physical injuries to make sure every crane we are going to take back to the wild is really healthy and, and can survive there. Um, and when we get, and this is how it looks like when we take them back to the wild. So with my work, this is the most moment that I really love, like to see these cranes going back to, to their natural habitat, getting the freedom that they have lost for a long time. So when we get them back to the wild, and, and this is how it's different, they get to be free, to live their natural, like to be free again, be in the wild. And uh, so in the park, we do not take them right away and release them. So we have identified another place like it's a and we fence it to make sure um these cranes are put there before they uh, to give them time to grow new feathers you can see some of these that have grown in new feathers they are called these are called flight feathers birds have like uh what we call flight feathers they are primary feathers and then secondary feathers and then there, there are some tertiary when you look from behind and by when you look for example this crane here it still has like missing so many uh, feathers that are crucial to the flight. So we give them time to grow new, new, new feathers. And whenever they are able to fly, this place where we take them, it's not fenced. They can fly out and go back into the wild, enjoy the national park. So this is how we do this. And uh, the good news is that most of the cranes we have been taking back to the wild, they have really started like nesting, and this is really makes us very happy when we see this because this could not happen when they were in captivity. And they have been having chicks and these chicks grow to increase the number of cranes in the whole country. So our program is contributing to increasing the number of these cranes, the number that was, that was really down, it's now recovering and increasing. So, but suddenly, like, uh, um, sadly, we have come across a huge number of cranes that have problems. Like this crane, this image has a problem. You see this right wing, it's really droopy. Um, this wing is broken and it's beyond repair. We, can, uh, we saw this crane when it has been a long time, and like inside the bones are broken, but they have healed in abnormal way. So it's really hard to, to save this, this wing. So these cranes, they cannot survive in a while. So we have found another place uh, that we call Umusambi village. Umusambi is a Kinyarwana name for these birds. So it's a place in the capital city where we have made a sanctuary for these disabled cranes. And we have over 50 disabled cranes in the area. And the good thing is that they are now living in a very good life, like a free life, 
but also we've made some nice walkways for people to come and visit them. Visit them. Whenever you guys can visit Rwanda, um, I will take you to this place. Um, it's so beautiful. So we do not only um, work with cranes, uh, like I told you I'm a vet, we also invest in communities. We do a lot of awareness to tell people, uh, to raise awareness, to tell them how we can work together to save these beautiful birds and their habitat, the wetlands that they rely on. We engage schools. We have, we have this comic book. Uh, it's a, a little comic book about my story of a little boy who grew up in a village uh, loving cranes and grew up to become a vet and save the cranes from, uh, from the threats they were facing. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of story that uh, is designed about me, but we try to tell kids they can be anything they want. They can be vets, they can, be, they can protect the environment, they can protect animals. And we try to inspire them um, to tell them things they can do to help. So we read together, we have questions and answers, and we make commitments. And uh, we also work with communities. We are really going deep in the communities, creating jobs, having like conservation champions, like all of these guys. We give them technology like smartphone, they monitor trends, they send us information. So we are trying really to engage communities at all levels. We want communities to be responsible, to own the cranes, to own the ecosystems nearby them and to manage them properly. So these are all the efforts that we do to make sure cranes are safe and their habitats are safe. But one important thing is we also do habitat restoration, like planting indigenous trees, trees for people and for wildlife. And one of the key, the most, uh, uh, the most interesting work that I really love to do is to work with kids. I really, we have like environmental clubs and uh, these kids, they really love going outside, learning about the environment and taking actions to save the environment. So all of these kids that you can see here, um, they, each one has trees that they own. They plant trees when they are tiny and, um, and they monitor them, they water them, they make sure these trees are growing. And I, I, I want to tell you that uh, three years ago, we started this program, and now all of these kids, they have trees that are taller than them. And recently, I received a call from a kid who had found a bird nesting in one of the trees that she has planted. She was so happy to see that happening. So we are trying to show kids, like, we can own something in nature. We can actually take, uh, it, it, it starts now. Like our nature, our environment is facing problem, and, but we are the future generations and it's now that we can be responsible and now we can own it because we can make, uh, prepare our future um, the way we want it to be. So these kids really like make, make me feel like uh, um, 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 the future is really bright for, for, for all of us. And this is something like I would really like to tell you all. Um, I, I really enjoy talking to young people, um, especially that I've also been young. And, and, and when I was little, no one told me about these threats, the, the problem that uh, our wildlife were facing, the problems that our world was facing. But now that I know, I want to tell as many and engage as many. And I, I really... It always makes me happy that I find when I find people, or especially young people, who come on board, who take actions to saving uh, wildlife. And and I want to tell you that um, uh, when I start this work, I was feeling alone. But now I have so many people from young age to old age, and we have people that we are working together. And it makes me feel like together we can make something big if we can put our efforts together like the little something we can do, the changes you can make in your life from where you are, we can, when it comes together, it makes a huge impact. And I want to tell you that uh, every year now we've been counting the great crown cranes in Rwanda. And from 2017, when we counted, uh, you see where the number was from 400. And now in 2020, we have counted about 800 cranes. And this is really nice 
um, and it's a result of working together, collective efforts. And I really want to bring like a, to to kind of challenge you, all of you, to start thinking like uh, what kind of like contribution you can put out there to contribute to to, to a better future of of, of our uh, our planet, um, our wildlife. Um, I would like to end by this little video by National Ge Geographic summarizes a little bit about uh, our mission and what we, we are trying to do. And then we can go to uh, question and answers after this video. So yeah, that's it. Anything is possible. And just, um, I always like to tell young people, like we can do anything. We can make, we can drive changes and we can make a world a better place. It's not late. And I really want to bring you on, all of you on board to put our efforts together to making some big, big changes to make our world a better place. Thank you so much. All right. Well, Olivier, thank you for such an, uh, awesome presentation. And, you know, the thing that always strikes me whenever we're together is your passion. Uh, your passion for the work you do, your passion is infectious and you can see the impact it's having on children in Rwanda. So thank you so much for that work and thank you for sharing it with our classrooms who are live with us uh, today. In fact, we're going to meet with some of those classrooms right now. So we have a whole bunch of classrooms tuning in via YouTube, classrooms in Ottawa, Guelph, Michigan, London, Kitchener, Sudbury, Georgetown. So keep those questions coming in via YouTube. And I'm going to bring in some of our live groups now. We're going to get some of their questions. So let's Yeah, should I stop stop sharing? Yeah, I took it out of the call already, so it's okay. We can see you. Yeah, there we go. Um, right. Okay, let's go to, um, let's start with Mrs. Buddha's group. They are in Markham, Ontario, grade sixes. I'm going to bring them into the call here. Hey, Mrs. Buddha, how are you? Great, thank you. So I'm actually live in my uh, house and my students are virtual all over York region, Markham, Newmarket, uh, Aurora area, uh, as well as Stouffville. And um, my question for you, for my one of my students, actually before that, I wanna say that we watched your video, which was really cute because we didn't really know uh, what they looked like, the gray crown crane. So we did a little bit of research. We saw the video that you did on for National Geographic about how they mate, which was really, really fun to watch. I highly recommend it. Um, so my students have a ton of questions. And one of them that uh, this morning was about the coronavirus and just wondering, has that had an impact on you and your organization on saving the cranes? Has that been a problem um, as of recent? I think, Olivier, can you still hear me? I think it might have froze. Okay. All right, we're just gonna hold on a second. Um, maybe we, his internet had a little blink or something, so hopefully he'll be able to pop back in uh, with us shortly. So let's just give him uh, a moment here. Um, Maybe while we're waiting, I have a quick question for you that a student, my student Annabelle just asked. Um, the funds for, where do you get the funds for Explore by the uh, seat of your pants? Um, how, who funds, who funds this? Because we've just been loving all your, all your virtual trips. Yeah, so we're pretty important for us that we never charge classrooms. So we keep what we do free for classrooms everywhere. Uh, so instead we go after grants, so government grants. 
Uh, and then we look to corporations for sponsorships uh, to sponsor the events uh, that we do each month. So in that way, classrooms can join in everywhere as much as they want, whenever they want. Excellent. Yeah. So he just ducked out of the call. So I think that means uh, he noticed that uh, he's off camera uh, and hopefully he'll pop back in and join us uh, very, very shortly. So we'll give about a moment if I don't see him. Uh, oh, I think I see, nope, not yet. Okay, so we'll give another minute. In fact, I'm just gonna pop over to my email uh, and I'm gonna get a quick message to him just to make sure um, he has the link, see if we can get him back in with us. It's possible the internet just went down. Um, there could have been a power outage. Um, you know, the, the area he's in is a little bit remote as well. So we're gonna keep our fingers crossed. We got the whole presentation in. Uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed that we do get to ask uh, Olivier some questions. If we can't get him back in, uh, if the signal is down, then we'll collect questions from the students uh, and we'll send those to him and we can send those back to the classrooms. So just bear with me for one moment while I send a quick message uh, to him. Okay, well, we're going to wait another minute or two uh, for him to get back in. While we do wait, I have another video I'm going to share. This is a video from earlier uh, in his work when he was first nominated for the Rolex Laureate Award, which is a really prestigious uh, award for, you know, making a real big impact in communities around uh, science and environmental issues. So we're going to play that little video. It's about two minutes long. Um, if he hasn't come in after that video, then we might have to um, wrap things up early today and I'll collect some questions from our classroom. So let me get my screen shared here and we'll check out that video together. All right. <laughs> Kids, we used to say, let's go in the march to see cranes dancing. When you hear them calling, you remember those times. They are really beautiful birds. The threats that these birds are facing, they are human-induced. One of the threats is destruction of the suitable habitat. Another is this illegal trade, people desire having them as pets in their house or in the hotel. They say, why aren't they flying? It's because they are kept there, their feathers are cut. If we don't do anything, they will go even extinct. I told myself, someone has got to do something. That's I started trying to write projects, look for support and promote and talk to people how species needs our help. What we have started is a, a registration of illegal capital rents. I have committed a team, people whom we are working together. We put a leg band to every crane in captivity. We also take GPS coordinates. We try to do a quick exam because we are trying to find which one can have the potential going back to the wild. There are a unique number of birds in captivity. We want to get them back to their natural habitat, to their freedom. By 
protecting it and protecting the all right so i'm going to pause that video there because i see we have olivia back olivia we lost you for a moment but it looks like we got you. i'm really really sorry i have two two sources of internet but yeah um decided to crash sometime don't worry about it all it's technology right yeah uh, all right so i'm gonna bring mrs buddha back in and we'll let her get the first question going Hi there. So uh, my question was from a student of mine, Tamil. He wanted to know, has the coronavirus impacted your work? Oh, um, so yeah, thank you so much. Like, it's a really very well thought for question. Uh, coronavirus has uh, impacted um, our work. People like to say negative and uh, only, but I also like to say negative and positive. So one of the negative negative ways uh, um, coronavirus is, has affected some of our communities where we work, and because of uh, like uh, increase like poverty and not finding resources, we've seen more communities going towards like. Uh, using some of the marshlands more and more and more and doing illegal activities so that puts uh, the habitat of cranes in, in a much more danger although we are working hard to really find a way we can uh, minimize those uh, effects and the other big uh, problem we've had as an organization is uh, we've uh, had like lack of funds we had many organizations that were supposed to give us funds and because they were affected financially, so they could not um, give us funds that were supposed to give us this year. So our organization uh, suffered in that way, not having sufficient fund to implement the work that uh, we wanted to do this year. But on a positive side, um, during like the lockdown, when everyone was uh, in, at home, uh, we learned of the crane chicks that were poached. And, and you know, like these are the kids, the, the kids from the village uh, where we have done like a campaign at school. They knew about the crane that was in someone's house, Porsche. And they went to talk to someone like another conservation champion. And the champion immediately came and they worked together to confiscate the chick and reunite it back to, the, like, to their parents. So, and this is uh, really something that struck me because um, I was at home. Uh, usually when I learned about this case, I take a car, I travel and I confiscate and I try like really to solve the issue, but I was helpless this time. So, but the conservation champion, the kids from our environmental clubs, they were able to solve the issue. And this is real like uh, ownership and then, and, uh, uh, the kind of conservation that we are targeting where we have like in these communities people who are in charge who really can take care of this wildlife and their habitat so that's something really positive that uh, i've seen through this coronavirus uh, crisis all right that's a great story olivia thanks so much for sharing that story with us i'm going to bring in mrs mills crew they're joining us in ontario how are we doing boys and girls hello <laughs> <laughs> You like this? <laughs> we were wondering, um, do the cranes have any predators? Oh yes, cranes have predator predators. Um, so in the national park where they live, or in the other places like wetlands, there are like uh, their predators can be like uh, uh, like some civets. Um, like uh, savo cats, we've seen leopards also uh, preying on 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 on, on cranes. We've had we've seen um, uh, jackals, um, and there are some other big birds. They they are called martial eagle, and they really they they are pre predators to the cranes. They will just even kill like a, a big cranes and and, and eat some parts of it. So yeah, cranes have predators. All right, I'm going to bring another group in live with us here. We're going to go to, uh, let's go to Mrs. Roberts' uh, crew this time in Georgetown. Hey, Mrs. Roberts, how you doing? Oh, can you grab the mute for us, Mrs. Roberts? <laughs> I'm great. I actually teach virtually too, so my students are um, sort of all over Milton, Georgetown, Acton. 
Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Yes. So uh, I have a few questions, but one of them was uh, from one from the students. Are cranes your primary focus, and do work to protect other endangered species as well? Oh yes. Um. So we, when I start the work, uh, yeah, the our primary species that we're protecting are gray crown cranes. But as the organization has been um, um, growing, we are working to saving other species in danger. We work to save the bats, bats like flying foxes. Uh, we are working to save the shoebill. It's a big bird with a, like a, a beak that is like a shoe shape. We are working to save uh, African gray parrots from illegal trade. We are working to save some antelopes that live in the wetlands called Sita Tunga. So uh, these are other projects that we have initiated since we have started our organization. All right, I'm gonna grab a question here from YouTube. Miss Davis's grade sixes are joining us and they wanna know, are the great, uh, are the crown cranes, are they aggressive birds? Are they difficult to capture and put bands on? Oh yeah, um, the great crown cranes, they are not really aggressive. They will not attack you. They, will, they are so humble and gentle. So, um, but like any other animal, if they are scared, they can sometimes peck at you. So sometimes when you are working with them, sometimes you have to be careful uh, with your eyes. Sometimes wear goggles because by any mistake, if, if the bird is scared, they can peck at you or in your eyes or somewhere else. So yeah, and the other thing is their nails. Sometimes they can go in your clothes or they can scratch you, but it's by accident. It's not, they never do any intentional attack, never. So, um, um, so, uh, like uh, capturing them so capturing them it's uh when we capture them from the in the wild they are really clever birds we've tried so many techniques to put uh, bands on them um and and they every time every technique that we try they come and see our traps and they see, look at them they, they they just move away so they are really they are so clever that you can think so we've been successful with a few cranes um, but when we capture them in captivity in, from people's garden, where they are in the hotels, uh, it's easy because in, they are flightless. They can't fly, so we can run after them and, and catch them uh, when they don't have uh, flight feathers. Um, so those are two, when they're in the wild, they are really hard to catch. But when they're in the people's garden and hotels, it's easy to capture them and they put bands on them. All right, we're gonna go to Sudbury, Ontario. Got uh, Mrs. Louiselle's group joining us. I'm going to bring her in. How are you doing today? Hi, we're doing fabulous here. We're up in Sudbury, Ontario. We just got a bunch of snow last night. Well, not much, five centimeters. So. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. No, it's not much really. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I teach grade five up here and I have kids from Manitoulin Island um, all over the place. Anyhow, I have a the greatest class, I think, in the country. Um, Anyhow, I have a lot of questions from my kids, which is amazing. Um, Ryder wants to know what's what's their um, lifespan. Oh, yeah. So great crown cranes can live really, really long. So um, in the wild, we always say that they can live uh, between 20 and 30 years uh, because um, yeah, there are predators or any other animals, but like in the zoos, in, in the places where there is no predator or when they have like a vet who care for them when they are sick, they can even go up in 50 years. So they really live long, like people. All right, let's take another trip here to another classroom. Oops, where did my page go? All right, there it is. Okay, so I'm gonna bring in there we go. Mrs. Jacobson, how are you doing? Okay. Right, uh, okay, oh, so the camera. And there we go. Mrs. Jacobson, oh, how are you doing? Good. Um, we're actually from Sudbury as well. And we've got a couple questions. So we we're wondering how dangerous the birds are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Great crown cranes are not dangerous. They are not dangerous at all. Um, they do not attack. They do not 
um, like uh, they will not make an intentional attack. So they are humble and gentle. Um, only when they are scared, sometimes they can peg uh, uh, someone. So they are not dangerous uh, at all. Yeah. Okay. So they are humble and all right. Uh, another only when they are scared, sometimes they can peg and um we were also wondering so one of my students were wondering since the birds are being held in captivity or being captured for pets do people actually eat these birds do people actually do what Do they eat them? Oh, um, so really, people, like in my country, Rwanda, there are um, people really try to respect animals. So there, we've seen like cases like in the villages where some people ate um, ate cranes, but it's only like a really, really few cases. Most people who keep them in their gardens, they love them, even though they don't know how to care for them properly or. It, it, even if it, though it's not good for the cranes, but they can't eat them really. Like so, it's just to keep to to bring them close to them because they love them. Yeah. All right. So, Miss Dykstra's group in Guelph, Ontario, are on YouTube, and they're wondering about the the crown, the fancy crown of feathers. Does that have a purpose? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, um, these are great crown cranes. They live uh, in the wetland and uh, and the grassland. So the crown is a kind of uh, a camouflage, a camouflage, like when sometimes when they are in the tall grasses, they blend in, like sometimes you can't see them because in the tall grasses and the color of, uh, of, of, of gold, like, um, and then the grass that are flowering, and sometimes really when they're in tall grasses, you, might, you find it hard to see them. So it's a kind of camouflage. But also in our culture, we have like a story about the, how cranes got its crown um it's a long story like it's, i'm not sure i would have enough time to 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 tell the story but yeah there's a story about it how the crane got, got their crown it's you know there are 15 species of great of of, of cranes in the world and uh these uh crown cranes they're the only one with a with a with with a crown and they are the only one actually that can even roost in the trees um, so they are special birds, very special. <laughs> very cool. So Miss Mills Group, I see your crew is having a snack. Do you guys have another question for us? Actually, no, they're just starting to head out for recess, but we really love this. I think we learned a lot. All right. Oh. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. It was great to see everybody. All right. Mrs. Buddha, do you have another quick question for us? Um, well, we had a lot of questions about fundraising and uh, what do you do with the fundraising, um, the money that you raise? How does it help you? So um, the money that we, we, we fundraise for, like um, we do a lot of uh, sorts of activities. So uh, in the beginning, we, were, we would like take all the animals and uh, employ people to care for them when they're in a quarantine, health checks. Um, like so that's salaries of people but also medicine like uh, to care for cranes um sometimes feed um and then um we like uh when we do like a test to look for their health sometimes there are things we can't see ourselves we send like some samples to some laboratories with uh, uh that are specialized to test for disease and we have to pay for that money for, for, for that. Um, then like, um, yeah, we try to, we buy equipment like binoculars to help to give to the communities like uh, who help us to monitor and, and watch the cranes. We give them uniform, we give them some like tickets like to buy water and when they are doing all the work. And we fundraise for money to help the, the kids clubs like, um, like uh, to really, do a range of activities, planting trees, cleaning the environment, um, and we help these kids do it at school. Sometimes we give them some equipment, like uh, notebooks, like uh, school bags, if we can, uh, really to help them to to uh, to, to, to also do it at school. Um, yeah, we fundraise to really work hard to make our nursery for trees to 
produce a lot of trees that we can take outside there and and uh, and, and and grow them to repopulate some of the wild areas so yeah we we finalized for some funds to run our sanctuary where we have cranes that we were not able to take back to the wild and every day day by day we need to monitor and help the cranes care for them feed them um in different uh, like uh yeah so yeah there is a lot of activities that we do and sometimes like uh, every year we do like the counts we involve like communities we involve uh, our conservation champions and rangers we hire a helicopter like to count the cranes in the whole country so we do uh, have a lot of uh, activities that really need uh, funds to, 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 to keep going all right well a suggestion to classrooms that are tuning in is you know if you're looking for something to support in your classroom um maybe a social justice activity or a little fundraiser or a bake sale or a popcorn day or something i think this would be an absolutely amazing uh a cause to get behind so i'm going to bring in uh mrs louiselle's group one more time in sudbury and then we'll visit mr robert's group before we wrap up today perfect i have two really good questions from my kids um one is is there's are there still cranes that are captive today and the second one is our kids want to get involved in helping animals and they're asking how do they get started with that in our area so um so um we uh, we have worked hard to remove all the cranes from captivity in our country in the other countries there are some cranes that are still captive but we have taken all in my country have taken all the cranes out of captivity so that's a really great achievement um so yeah for someone who wants to help uh, animals in their home whatever they are from i think um one of the biggest advice is really to work at to creating like space for nature so um there might be some animals that are endangered like most of the time when we talk about animals people like uh, we all think the big species big animals but let's start from thinking in our yard in our um, what can we do to support the little tiny animals that are there? Like, uh, um, yeah, how can we create an environment that can support um, those little animals? Um, like, I know, like, um, I, I don't know how your your neighborhood or it looks like, but planting the trees, planting like really saving some spaces for nature, like where like spiders or insects, whatever they can survive. Every single species really counts and every species needs us and they are so like they have a role they play in our ecosystem so if we can um all of us like start from where we are and later on you can think big think like uh, have a big idea of how you can help in the whole village in the whole country in the whole like start now think of a big idea of how you can help but right now start from where you are create space for nature that's my uh, first advice, but yeah, we can do anything. Think big, and and then and then you can just later on make a huge, huge impact. Yeah. All right, I think that's awesome advice. Is look to your communities, uh, and and you're so right. Nature is really resilient. If we give it space, if we give habitat, uh, then we can help protect uh, animals right in our own communities. Uh, Mrs. Roberts, we'll give you one more question. Okay. Um... My class is wondering if your favorite moment in um, the process of protecting birds was when all of the villagers returned the captured cranes, or do you have a different favorite moment in um, protecting the birds? So um, my best moment is like uh, when I release a crane that used to be captive and I see them fly, I really sometimes I close my eyes and, and fly with them uh, like as a kid i always wanted to fly like cranes and 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 at some points i thought i had lost it i didn't know how i can fly but i found my way of flying so every time i see a crane that really was captive and is able now to fly and enjoying the freedom i close my eyes and fly with them so that's the best moment like that i really enjoy i see there was one question um in the chat uh, asking if if the yellow tuff, tufts are only for males and the answer is no like uh, male and female cranes they all have 
uh, the, 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 the crown, the golden, uh, the, the yellow tufts. And they, they are so similar. They are not different in the, in, the, in, the, in the weight, in the colors. They are all similar, males and females. And they will do actually the same, the same behavior. So it's really hard to differentiate them. Sometimes you have to, to do like the blood to identify which bird is which through blood, like sexing, to know which one is a female, which one is a, is a male. All right, so I wanna share the website here for uh, LeVay's organization. So please do check it out. Um, and classrooms out there, think about a potential project or something you could do, because I think this could be a really fun way um, to raise some awareness around your school, maybe in your community, uh, and then help out a really great organization. So I wanna give a shout out to all the classes joining us on YouTube today. Thank you for the amazing questions uh, and joining us today. A huge shout out to all of our camera groups, the virtual uh, groups, as well as the ones still uh, in the classroom. Thank you so much. And Olivier, thank you so much for joining us today, joining us live, uh, giving us a little time to share your work and it's having an impact. I mean, you just have to look at those excited uh, you know, uh, boys and girls planting their trees and seeing them grow and reporting what they see in the communities. And I think that passion is going to spread outside the country as well. So thank you so much for what you do and sharing it with us today. Yeah, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure really to, to share with you and see all of the young people really with a passion to, to, to the environment, to saving our nature and our wildlife. So yeah, um, together we can do it. Yeah, we can make the world a better place. All right. Well, thanks to everybody for tuning in uh, and we'll see you next time around. Thanks everyone.